Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings leading minds in energy to discuss the latest challenges and trends transforming and modernizing the utility industry of the future. And a quick thank you to West Monroe, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. My name is Jason Price, Energy Central podcast host and director with West Monroe, coming to you from New York City. And once again, I'm joined by Matt Chester, Energy Central podcast producer and community manager, dialing in from Orlando, Florida. Matt, today's episode features the marriage of two rapidly advancing and in-demand energy technologies, microgrids and nuclear generation. As you watch the conversations taking place on the Energy Central community platform, how in focus are these topics recently? You're right about that, Jason. And I think these are two of the hottest topics in recent months, not only on Energy Central, but in the utility industry more widely. As regulators, power companies, and consumers all seek out ways to ensure low carbon generation without sacrificing on power quality, grid reliability, and energy affordability, both microgrids and of advancing nuclear tech are two topics that come up again and again. Though I'd say more often than not, our community members are discussing these ideas separately. So I'm really eager for today's guests to highlight their intersection. That's great. And I appreciate that insight into where the Energy Central's collective attention seems to be. And it highlights how this topic is one ripe for a deep dive with some resident experts. So we're joined today by two industry leaders who work at Idaho National Labs, one of the premier laboratories in the U.S. Department of Energy Systems. And they are the ones who are advancing our idea of how nuclear generation and advanced microgrids are coming together to truly create a net zero grid of tomorrow. First, we're joined by John C. Kendasami, INL's net zero program director. She has a career in the world of nuclear energy, stretching across utility companies, private commercial manufacturers, and ultimately where she's been the last three and a half years under the DOE umbrella. John C., welcome to today's episode of Energy Central's Power Perspectives podcast. Thank you, Jason. Happy to be here. And to bring the microgrid expertise to the conversation, we're also fortunate to welcome Kurt Myers, project manager and staff engineer who specializes in INL's work on microgrids. Kurt has been with the lab for over 25 years and has been a key part of various teams working with multiple government and industrial entities with a focus on power transmission and distribution, which now features that focus on microgrids. Thanks for joining us as well, Kurt. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Certainly. So we've featured National Lab podcast guests before, including one of your colleagues at Idaho National Labs. So no doubt our audience is familiar with this crown jewel system within the U.S. Department of Energy. But I also know the work being done is quite multifaceted. So I want to start by asking if you could respond to which of the priorities at INL are the ones that you are actively pursuing, and what are the goals and outcomes driving your corner of INL? Sure. There are three goals I'd like to talk about here at INL. Goal number one, achieve net zero. And net zero is a lab priority that advances our mission to create clean energy solutions using nuclear. The second goal is to leverage the talent across the lab. I mean, we have amazing people here from those working on nuclear to homeland security to microgrids and turning waste into usable products to really create a holistic solution. And goal three is the solutions we demonstrate here will be flexible enough so that can be adapted by cities and towns across the goal. Thank you, John C. Kurt, what about you? Yeah, thanks, John C., for the lead in there. Yeah, and uh, just kind of bouncing off of what John C. Uh, was mentioning, we take that perspective and work with other government agencies to also help them with their uh, net zero and energy security and resiliency uh, goals, and also work with private industry partners to talk with them about some of the future technologies that may be needed and some of the control systems and other aspects that it would take to integrate these various systems together both within microgrids and within, uh, you know, larger bulk grid systems. That's great. Thank you for you both for that background. 
So with lots of progress taking place these days, we know that development of advanced nuclear technologies has become somewhat synonymous with INL. But as we note in the introduction, you're identifying the benefits that nuclear can bring to the grid, not only by itself, but in strategic alignment with microgrids. So Kurt, let's stay with you. What does that alignment look like? So yeah, we've been doing work in the microgrid arena for many, many years you know, heavily in conjunction with Department of Defense and other government agencies, you know, more from the uh, kind of the energy security, you know, reliability, backup power aspects. But now with the, you know, more of the technologies becoming more prevalent and available, it's becoming a lot more interesting in that intersection between, you know, the localized uses and the behind the meter use cases and some of the interactions you can have with a bulk grid the other side of the meter or also connecting with other microgrid systems. And then of course, when you bring in, you know, nuclear, the other renewables, energy storage, and the other clean energy, you know, low carbon resources, you know, just a lot of interesting possibilities there from a controls and interaction between different grid systems. Yeah, and I wanna talk more about the transitioning to the clean grid. So one of the criticisms we often hear is that the accelerated energy transition is that it may be sacrificing reliability, particularly as baseload generation is replaced with intermittent renewables. John, see, over to you. Nuclear energy obviously can have big help in plugging in some of those gaps, but what might be missing in that process that this pairing with microgrids is able to address? Jason, thank you for that question. Yeah, I would say, you know, my, the beauty of the microgrids is really uh, the ability to island yourself or be able to connect to the main commercial grid and variable generation is a problem for energy providers who most of them supplement intermittent energies with energy from coal and gas fire plants. Nuclear can absolutely provide that base load of energy. The grid really needs to be stable. And advanced nuclear nowadays is unique in that it can change output much more quickly than the traditional large light water reactors that we have operating today and really provide 24-7, reliable, flexible, clean power for decades to come. Kurt, we recognize that the government-backed work at INL is often used as a test case, a living example of what can be possible commercially. So as your teams work on the marriage of microgrid and nuclear generation, what are the types of situations and communities this type of opportunity can most benefit from? So yeah, Jason, we we are um, you know really investigating deeply you know island grid locations, uh, places where you have maybe grid congestion or or lack of infrastructure, places where the cost of delivering fuel or providing transmission distribution into those areas is a higher cost area, and then maybe you know cold weather climates or or warm climates as well, uh, where you have uh, challenges with remoteness and access to some of those uh, resources and, and supply chains. And then kind of expanding from that, once we develop those kind of test cases and first of a kind projects, migrating from there into, into more you know, energy security, and ener energy resiliency type locations where you have a higher reliability requirement, higher availability needs for a you know, particular customer set, whether it's critical loads for services in, in cities and in counties or if it's a you know military base or industrial process where having power go out right in the middle of a process or a, or a response to a, an event is a big challenge so you know really places that have those high high supply chain challenges or high resiliency you know reliability requirements is where we're focusing some of our initial assessment and, and test cases yeah that certainly makes sense my next question i'd like to hear from both of you for the past few years We've seen a lot of federal funding make their ways to new ideas and technologies in pursuit of grid modernization and the clean energy transition overall. Has any of the recent legislation pushing new energy investments made a direct impact on the work you're doing? Kurt, why don't you start and then John C., feel free to follow up. So, yeah, I would say it does, it does show impact. Sometimes it takes a few years to, you know, to work through the system in terms of, you know, lab calls, other, other FOA or industry calls for uh, proposals but you know you're seeing it with some of the new bills that just recently got passed the uh, infrastructure bill the 
the IRA bill that just got passed. And we're seeing that start to trickle into programs like long duration energy storage. Of course, preceding that, you know, we had grid modernization initiative for several years that came. Its uh, starting point was, was some of those prior bills that were passed several years ago. But yeah, we're, we definitely see impacts from those and, you know, a lot of, lot of work that's being driven by that in terms of, you know, improving energy storage, improving modernization of grid. Some of the new the nuclear small modular and micro reactor developments are all kind of resulting from some of that legislation. And, and to follow on to what Kirk was saying, I think funding for hydrogen projects is going to help us demonstrate how we can take nuclear and provide not only carbon free electricity, but it's also going to be able to fuel for clean transportation. We have a large fleet here at INL, over 600 vehicles, and you know, using the funds to generate hydrogen and be able to do research on that is going to be a big, huge plus. And also our vision of the net zero city is going to demonstrate how nuclear can be incorporated into a microgrid, produce carbon free electricity when it's needed most and generate value added products like hydrogen and ammonia and heat for manufacturing when energy demands drop. So. I see there's going to be direct impact here with some of the legislation pushes that we've been seeing. And certainly when we talk about nuclear, it obviously raises the question for many is the concerns around safety, risk, and costs. I'd love to hear from each of you talk about that a bit. You know, share with us you know, how you see the work at INL is doing in these areas to address these concerns and whether or not they are warranted in the first place. And John C., why don't you start and Certainly, Kurt, if you have anything to add, feel free. Sure. Thanks, Jason. You know, if you look at the information according to the U.S. Energy uh, Administration, nuclear energy is really the single largest U.S. source of carbon-free, round-the-clock, 24-7 electricity. And we really need to incorporate nuclear, and we can't reach the climate goals set out by the United Nations without nuclear. I think the biggest hurdle, and you kind of mentioned a little bit, is, is really making nuclear reality and to address the hurdle of the public concern over safety and waste disposal. So we're looking at all of that here at INL. You know, there's a lot of publicity surrounding events like Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, which has created concerns. We're not going to skirt around that. So we're starting to look at all the numerous advances since those events that happened around safety. NRC here in the United States, they actually, from a nuclear power plant, they hold the plants to the highest security standards of any industry that I've seen in my years in this industry. And not because just because I grew up in the nuclear industry, but it really every single plant is monitored and they exceed those standards that have been set by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I would say a nuclear power plant is probably one of the safest, not only from a physical, radiological, cybersecurity, from an industrial event in environment in the United States. They're also designed to withstand earthquakes, extreme weather patterns, and obviously with, with all this increasingly prevalent change that we're seeing in the climate of uh, being able to weather most of those these designs that were set up years ago that had looked into this regarding waste you know the nuclear industry is unique that it, it is one of the few industries that manages all of its own waste we don't rely on others to manage our waste for us for example the nuclear reactors they pay for decommissioning the waste handling and disposal all up front, even before the construction starts. And if you look at today in the United States, the waste that's generated by nuclear in comparison to other industries is very, very small. All the used fuel produced by the commercial nuclear industry since the 1950s, since the beginning of the nuclear power generation commercially, it would probably cover a football field to height of less than 10 yards. And coal plants generate the same amount of waste every hour. So when you look at all of these, the benefits outweighs from a carbon-free electricity to any, any concerns that might be out there. That was very helpful. Thank you for that, John C. So now we have in our show something called the lightning round, which is where we get to learn a little bit more about both of you 
not the professional, but on the personal level. Uh, we have five questions. And we ask for uh, either one word response or phrase. So at this point, we're going to pivot towards that. And I guess the question to start with is, are you both ready? Ready. <laughs> ready. Okay. John, so we'll start with you and then Kurt, you can follow. First question, what's the best meal of the day? I'd say breakfast, waking up to the smell of coffee. Yeah, my preference would be uh, dinner. Second question, what superpower would you choose to have? I'd like to see into the future, Jason. I think mine would be uh, be able to fly. Third question, what's your perfect Sunday afternoon? Quietly sitting, painting, or reading a book. Just enjoying time for myself. Yeah, I think for me it would be either relaxing and, and uh, watching some sports or a documentary program, or I wasn't relaxing being outdoors and uh, rock climbing or skiing or whatever time of year it is, uh, just doing an outdoor activity. Fourth question, what career path did you envision your, for yourself when you were growing up? For me, I thought I was going to be a physician, doctor, but um, after I did my first internship, at a nuclear power plant, decided I wanted to be an engineer. Yeah, for me, I, I saw myself in the sciences or engineering or uh, architecture. Actually, my first thought was architecture, but I uh, moved more into uh, sciences and engineering after uh, getting into college. So, And I guess working on microgrids and grid systems, there is a lot of uh, architecture aspects involved in that, trying to conceptualize and, and design those systems. Very nice. And fifth question, what are you most motivated by? Success, winning. <laughs> I think I'm most motivated by the possibilities for change and uh, transitioning to, to cleaner energies and, and being more environmentally conscious and sustainable. Well, nicely done. Uh, thanks for giving us a peek behind the curtains. So we want to give you both the last word to our audience. So what's the takeaway message you hope our utility professional audience retains from today's conversation? Kurt, we'll go to you first. I think the biggest thing that I would like to, to focus on is to make sure that people are looking at the design of these clean energy systems in the future and that it is possible to do a clean energy system, a lot of the resource Capabilities are there now, a little bit more needs to be developed, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done and things that can be implemented in the near term to, to push us to that end goal. So definitely a lot of hope and, and a lot of good possibilities there. And John C? Yeah, I would echo what Kurt said and I would add that really I think we need to understand that we're the reason and the activities have really accelerated the climate change and we absolutely have it in our power and the ability to really take action with carbon-free electricity and, and reducing our carbon emissions. And we can correct it. We absolutely can and or slow it down to really for our children in the future. Well, this is a great conversation and much appreciate both of you for sharing your wisdom today. I certainly know that our, our audience will appreciate it as well and they will be able to post questions and comments on the Energy Central platform. So. We have an active community that probably has a lot of thoughts to share. So please be on the lookout for some of those on, the, on energycentral.com. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today and all the fascinating insight that both of you were able to share. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, you can always reach John C. and Kurt through the Energy Central platform where they welcome your questions and comments. And we also want to give a shout out of thanks to the podcast sponsors that made today's episode possible. Thanks to Wes Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. West Monroe brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure, advisory on transportation electrification, ADMS deployments, data and analytics, and cybersecurity. And once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. So stay plugged in and fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. And we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. Mm -hmm.